Hi and welcome to week six, Intro to Psychology 1. We're carrying on from where we left off with sleep disorders and carrying on with this alter states of consciousness in terms of how we can alter our states of consciousness. And we looked at sleep as one alternative way in which we do that on a normal everyday sort of rhythm based on the circadian rhythm. Now what we're going to look at here today is looking at altered states of consciousness as it relates to things like meditation and we're going to look at hypnosis and we'll look at um, psychoactive drugs and the implications that that has on altering states of consciousness and then we'll lastly follow through with what is some of the terms used to describe drug dependencies and tolerances. So I hope this is an interesting chapter. Please take advantage of uh, watching the video in the journal. It's an excellent video looking at the current research in the area of consciousness. All right. So good luck and enjoy. Okay, now we're going to look at alternatives to alternative consciousness. And we're going to look at meditation, hypnosis, and we'll look also at psychoactive drugs. Now with meditation, this is a technique for focusing attention. And one of the focus points would be either on an object or be on a word or on your own breathing or on body movements and the attempt is to try to uh, make effort to block all, all distractions and by doing so can relax the body and achieve a higher level of well-being and achieve somewhat of an altered state of consciousness. This includes things like yoga, Zen and transcendental meditation and it can be helpful with physical and psychological problems like lowering blood pressure and learning how to control emotions. Now, meditation, for example, can look very much uh, like this, and I'm going to just walk you through an example. Where you find a quiet place to sit or lie down in a comfortable position, you close your eyes, and you relax all muscles deeply. And what you do is you sort of get into a relaxed position, you breathe comfortably in and out, and you just focus on a part of your body. Start with your feet and move up slowly upward. You relax your legs, you relax your buttocks, your abdomen, your chest, your shoulders, your neck, and your face. Allow the whole body to remain in this deeply relaxed state. You concentrate on your breathing. You breathe in, in and out through your nose. When you breathe out, silently say the word one to yourself or mmm or coffee. Whatever word gives you a sense of peace and comfortable, and just it's a fo it's a focusing um, strategy, and you repeat this process for about 20 minutes, and then you re when you're finished, remain seated or in your lying down position, first with your eyes closed, and then you slowly open them up and become more aware of your surroundings. Now this is a a, a, a body relaxing meditation, uh, meditations are just really about focusing on the stream, if you will, letting, it th letting things come in one ear and out the other and not focusing on any one thought, just focusing, if anything, on your breathing or on a single word, and it's an altered state. Now, you may have been familiar with hypnosis, and this is a procedure through which one person, usually the hypnotist, uses the power of suggestion to induce a person's change or a change in, in the person's thoughts, in their feelings, their sensations, perceptions, or behaviors. Now, what's important to note here is that this is a technique of suggestibility. You're not putting anybody into some sort of a trance by which you can control somebody. You've seen people dangle watches in front of somebody's face and then hypnotize them. It's really about focusing on a specific point as you can see in the image on the top left, it's a pen. And sometimes it can be done just through words. Now you may have attended some sort of a, um, an entertaining evening where there's been a hypnotist who's hypnotized a group of people. Well, one, everybody who was hypnotized uh, would have been or could have been hypnotized under a different situation. They are considered relatively to very suggestible it's a technique of suggestion, not of any sort of trance. And secondly, you can't make somebody do something they wouldn't have otherwise done. 
So anything you saw someone do on stage is something they probably would have in another circumstance done. You can't make somebody kill somebody um, if they weren't otherwise predisposed to do something along those lines. Between 80 and 95% of people are hypnotizable to some degree. And about 5% can reach the deepest levels of hypnosis. Now some of hypnosis can be used because of the altered state that it can induce can be used for pain control, can be used to help somebody through past experiences that they otherwise find difficult to manage or handle. I remember when I was in university, I uh, did a paper on post-hypnotic suggestion and there was a, um, a, a dentist in Kitchener who was using hypnosis as a way of um, helping people manage pain without using an anesthetic and his technique was to use a clothespin. And so this clothes peg would be put on the earlobe of a person and they would be given a suggestive, uh, a, 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 uh, using a suggestion uh, a technique that would be hypnotism in basis and foundation that the, the clothes peg was blocking pain centers to their teeth. He was able to do his work without using anesthesia. It's pretty impressive. Now, one of the areas that probably gets the most notoriety as an altered state are psychoactive drugs or alcohol. And one of the things to be aware of that any substance that has a powerful effect on the brain and alters it, alters the consciousness, the mood, the perception or thought is what's known as a psychoactive drug. Now these can be either legal or illegal that alters mood and perception. And even if these uh, drugs are tested and approved, they're considered to be controlled substances, they too may fall under the umbrella of psychoactive drugs. So when we look at controlled substances, this can be uh, anything that's been approved for medical use can be a, um, um, a psychoactive drug. I mean, a lot of times, a lot of times using in mental health issues around um, psychological disorders, medication is used that is a psychoactive drug. Illicit drugs, um, these are drugs that are illegal. And then you would also find over-the-counter drugs. Antihistamines, for example, can be um, powerful drugs in their own way, and even addictive. Um, decongestants, herbal preparations, and even certain foods such as chocolate can have the alteration of consciousness, mood, perception, or thought. And so it starts to give a different perspective around uh, what might act as a drug. Okay, when we look at um, the effects on consciousness, um, we can look at three major drug categories. We have stimulants, or also known as uppers. Things like caffeine, nicotine, amphetamines, and cocaine can all be considered uppers that can affect, again, mood, perception, thought. Then you have um, depressants or downers, alcohol, barbiturates, and narcotics. And then hallucinogens, um, LSD, ecstasy, ecstasy and uh, marijuana, for example. Now with stimulants, this speeds up the central nervous system. It can also suppress appetite and can make you feel more awake or alert and energetic. It increases blood pressure and respiration and increased dosage can feel, you can feel jittery, nervous and restless. Stimulants do not give additional energy. They use our stores of energy sooner, depleting our stores, leaving us tired and depressed. Not clinical depression, just lower state of energy. Hallucinogens can alter our perception of space and time, alter our mood and produce feelings of unreality magnifying users current moods or frame of mind. Hallucinogens, um, the sensation of having no base in reality. Depressants, these decrease activity of the central nervous system. It slows down bodily function and reduces sensitivity from outside stimulation. Now what influences it, sorry, I'm going to move across here. When we talk about, you know, drug dependence, and drug tolerance, um, we can look at what we also know as addiction. And drug t dependence is the compulsive pattern of drug use where the user develops a drug tolerance coupled with unpleasant withdrawal symptoms 
when the drug is discontinued. Now, some of the things that can affect or influence the addictive potential of drugs is how quickly the effects of the drug are felt, how pleasurable the drug's effects are, how long the pleasurable effect lasts, and how much discomfort is experienced when the drug is discontinued. Now, drug tolerance, on the other hand, and anyone who's been familiar with anyone who has been abusive or drug dependent, the conditions in which the person progressively um, um, becomes progressively less affected by the drug. Therefore, they need more of the drug to get the same sort of effect they used to get. And so by having larger doses to maintain the same high um, becomes a stronger and stronger drug dependence as the tolerance increases. And so psychological drug dependence, this is probably if you will, tougher to circumvent and to get over than is the physical dependence. The physical dependence is something that your body will eventually um, rid itself of over some period of time. Psychological dependence, this is the craving or the in irresistible urge for the drug's pleasurable effects. Now, this is more difficult to combat than physical dependence. Usually, the drug... Um, um, may, the drug may not be the physical, be that physically addictive, but it can still cause psychological dependence. For example, if a person who is, um, you know, over their their physical need for the drug, and they've been out of a neighborhood while they've been receiving the help, and they go back to an old neighborhood, places where they've been before, where they have used that drug, become difficult to not use the drug again. They become psychologically dependent on things that they've seen and done before, it have to break that. You know, when they meet up with old friends and they offer them, you know, um, to partake in that very drug that they were trying to stop, sometimes it's that psychological dependence on the friendship, the camaraderie, that is more difficult to break than the actual physical dependency on the drug. And then lastly is withdrawal syndromes, symptoms. This is where the physical and psychological symptoms that occur when you, when a regular user of drugs is discontinued. It usually the exact opposite of the effects when the person is on drug is what the withdrawal experience is. Uh, it can be physically harmful, that is to say it can be very painful. Symptoms terminate when the drug is taken again. And this is the problem if you will, or the difficulty for some people when it comes to withdrawal symptoms is as soon as they take the drug, they're feeling better again. Okay, there we go. We're ready to go into the next week. I hope things are going well for you. Good luck on the rest of the semester and keep up the hard work.